You come in, but you're not getting what you really need. And life is moving forward and you wonder, Father, I feel like a barren place. I feel like I forgot what it is to radically use the name of Jesus. I forgot what it is to to stand under the prophetic heart of God. I've kind of forgot what it is, but but Lord, I I seem like I've been kind of comfortable, but I'm dry on the inside. There's something else I've got to have. He's saying we're baptized in the Holy Ghost and yet being desperately dry on the inside needs to be challenged. You say, God, I must not be filled as you want me to be filled because if I was really filled, there would be rivers of living water pouring from my being and I would be more than satisfied. God is a God that wants you to walk under the flow of his anointing. He wants you to walk under the fires of his revival. Jesus came to restore you back a divine fellowship with grace and he desires to lavish himself in his kingdom down on you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. You have to be the most radical, supernatural thing on planet earth, the ones that represent Jesus Christ in all that he really truly is out of glory. Sometimes we find ourselves in that dried place, in that, in that deserted place, and, and we wonder how things kind of got to that place, and we find ourselves thirsty once again, and that's the best place to be if you're really dry, and that's thirsty. Because if you're thirsty, then you're looking for drink. If you're thirsty, you're not satisfied. If you're thirsty, you're longing for what you need. If you're thirsty, you know there's something better. If you're thirsty, you're going to start pursuing. If you're thirsty, you want to start chasing it down. If you're thirsty, you want to get wet. If you're thirsty, you want to get filled. If you're thirsty, you want to get saturated. If you're thirsty... When you're thirsty, you want everything God has got. When you're thirsty, you got to have it all. When you're thirsty, you recognize there is lack in your life. When you're thirsty, you understand the desert place. It doesn't matter where you're at because when you're thirsty, it's just not what God wants for you. And you know it. John's Gospel, chapter 4, where I had you, Jesus is going to travel through Samaria. Kind of a deserted area as he goes through up into Galilee or coming down and he's going to travel through that place. And he knows why he's going to travel through that place. Because he's going to bring to a connection of things of old, of covenants of God and promises of God. And he wants to bring those into the present state. There was a well there. It's called the well of Jacob. And it's a deep well. and It's a dry place. You got to get your bucket. You got to go way down inside that well and try to get some water out of that well. Is that God's best for you? Hanging around a kind of a dry, half, half empty well, trying to find a little water down at the bottom. And that's supposed to be your God hungry Christian experience. See, the well was very important because. Not only was it the well that said of Jacob, really it was the well in which Abraham himself had actually come to the place of as he began to travel through the land. And it was a covenant place. Somebody say covenant. Covenant. When God makes covenant, God will honor the covenant. When you come to the place where you really want the covenant that God said he would honor. Somebody say, I want to honor God's covenant. I want to be in the place where the cross of Calvary is. I want to be under the anointed flow of God. I want to walk under the power of the blood, just kind of mumble it into your spirit. I want to be where God wants me to be. I want to know cleansing, healing, delivering, forgiving power. I want to come back. This well, it may have been a place that God set, but it doesn't seem to have what it was supposed to have. Jacob inherited that well. It was in a place called Shechem. And and Jacob, as he would get that plot of ground, he he would give it to Joseph. And to the tribe of Joseph, he would hand it to them, and they would have the well, and it would, and it would water their flocks, and it would water their herd, but they always had to keep coming back. Well, over time, everything gets abandoned, and a place of covenant doesn't seem to have much. It's also located very strategically between two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim. Two mountains that go back to the day of Moses and not up up to the government of Joshua. 
These two mountains actually, actually one is to the, one is to the south, Gerizim, and one is right to the north, Ebal, and right between the two of them is Shechem, which is the land where the well is that Jesus is about to visit. And this well is between two mountains which represent the very covenants of God. When the children of Israel came across, they were told by Moses that they were to get the law and they were to inscribe it on rocks and over and overlay it with lime and, and build it as an altar and put it on the northern mountain on Ebal. And they were to gather some of the tribes on the northern mountain and some of the other tribes on the southern mountain, which is called Gerizim, and they were to speak one to another. They were to cry out the very government of God and the judgments of God, and then the other side was to cry out the blessings of the obedience of God. Both of these were to be hurled back and forth over the well. Gerizim's tribes were Levi, you are the priesthood. Gerizim's tribe was Judah, you are the worshipers of God. Gerizim's job, tribe was Joseph, which is, which is a platform of promise. And Gerizim's tribe was also Benjamin, from which kingship came. That was the side of blessing. The other side would have to hurl forth. Cursed is the one who disobeys. Cursed is the one who steps back. Because the law was written. It was inscribed. It was set there in life. They were to always to remember it. So they would declare what is to fail. But the other side is always. Somebody say always. Always to overdo that side and the blessings. We're always to overtake and confront and defeat every curse. Quite a day that must have been. 1,400 years before Jesus would stand at that well. The nation would stand and make covenant with God right there and declare we will walk in the blessings of God. Now we are 1,400 years later. They forgot who they are. They don't know where they stand. They're a broken people. Demonic activity, sickness, disease. They've lost their governmental anointing. There's been no real prophetic word for 400 years. And yet there the well dwells. And there the two mountains dwell. And I tell us as the body of Christ... It doesn't matter the season in which you might have been away from the things of God. God's platform is right there. All it needs is one touch from the master's hand. One touch from glory. And God knows exactly what to do. You got a well. Maybe you've been a well. Maybe you've been operating that way, dry and half empty and not sure. And you're not walking as who you know you should be walking as church. We are to walk as the blood bought, as the redeemed, the anointed of God, walking under the holy covenants of God. Because when you read it all, you know it, you know it, you know it, you know it. It belongs to you. Say, it belongs to me. It belongs to me. It belongs to me. How can you move devils if you don't walk in authority? How can you know the heart of God if you can't speak it forth? How can you stand in the blessings of, unless you understand the provision? Church, you've never been called the lack. You've been called to the abundance of God's grace and his kingdom in your life. You are called to be the greatest thing planet Earth has ever had. The declaration of Jesus Christ and the revelation of his kingdom. We are to emulate Jesus, the angels of glory. Listen, the angels of glory are... The angels of glory are supposed to shout over the church because that's how awesome you are. And you've got to know that. And if you know that, you make a decision. I don't like where I'm at. It's time for a change. Fourteen hundred years has passed, and Jesus, eternity steps into time. Salvation and redemption arrives at where the curse has been. And just because he chose to, it's time for a visitation. Somebody say visitation. visitation. It's time for a visitation. visitation. And Jesus comes walking through there, shuffling in the dirt, and he arrives at that place. The place of covenant, the blessings and confrontings and the cursing and the very well of the promise of God. Everything representing the kingdom and he arrives right there. 
and he sits. Can you imagine that? The Son of God arrives at Jacob's well and sits. And he asks a woman who's lost in sin, and that's not judging her. The issues of her life are broken. Her, her life is not in order. She's had a handful of different husbands, and she's living with somebody just because she can. And that's why she come to the well at that time of the day, because she would come when nobody... But nobody else would come, so she wouldn't have to deal with the mocking and, and the insults and, and the verbal hurts and everything else. So she would come all by herself. That's a sad story, but she came all by herself because she didn't want to come under the condemnation and under the guilt, but she didn't know what to do. But all she had was this little well. All she had was this dried up kind of well. All she had was a well sitting between promises, and there was no sound out of heaven until now. In the midst of a dry and thirsty land, God still got his covenant. And Jesus walks up, sits down, he asks that woman for a drink. It's called dialogue. Somebody say dialogue. It's how we start a dialogue. He says, woman, could you give me a drink of water? And she says, sir, I, you don't have a cup. That's fine. But you don't have anything to draw from. How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan? For what Jews have, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We're a nobody sitting at the foot of the mountain of the greatest blessings of God. And Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink. If you knew who I was, you would not want this water, but you would want the water that I have. You would ask of me. You would ask of me. In your barren state, you would ask of me, give me living water. Somebody say living water. You would ask of me life-producing life producing life Life-giving water, you would ask of me if you knew who it was that sat here. You know, we ask God for a lot of things. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I got to have that. Chase us, chase us, chase us, chase us, chase us. Travail, intercession, because I got to have this and this. How about we ask of the master for the one thing he delights to give us? It's not the gifts, it's the provision. Because I, if I give you the provision, then you have everything you need to bring forth all the gifts. I need the provision of God. And the provision is the life of God. Church, we don't need things. We need heaven. We need the life of God. We need the river of God. We need the rain of God. We need the water of God. We need everything that God has. We need to be saturated. Church, that's what we're lacking. We can have natural things, but we're lacking spiritual things. And Jesus is arriving at our wells. Don't mean to shout, but I do. He's arriving at our wells. And of course, the woman doesn't know what to say. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where do you get living water? That's a good question. Can you imagine the light of the world, the creator of the universe, is sitting right there? He's sitting right there at your well. Hallelujah. He's sitting. And I got something. I just, I just, I just, I just want to say what, what, what God wants to do here. And he says, you have nothing. Is it, are you greater than our father, Jacob? Well, yeah. Yeah. Jacob saw me. Jacob saw the angels of God ascending and descending. That was me. I'm the latter. Now, he doesn't say all that, but you and I get to know that. He's like, mm-hmm. Can you imagine you're standing with the word of God, literally with him, and he says, are you greater than all these things? Are you greater than Jacob who gave us as well and drank from it himself as well as his, has his own livestock, his own sons? And that's all she's got to offer is a past moment 
I remember when there was a little, when there was a little rain here, when there's a little anointing. I remember what, what happened. Are you greater than Jacob? Were his kids? Yeah, but what about you? You're at the same well, and you're broken, and you're hurting, and you're lost. And you're sitting in a well that gave natural water, yet in the middle of the covenants of God and not even realize the potential that is surrounding you. And Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Now, I really need the body of Christ in this seat. I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit wants. He wants us to come back to him. He is the revealer of the king. The Father released to us the Holy Spirit to fill you and empower you. And we've lost sight of him for things. We've, we've sidestepped his anointing and we call things that are not as though they are. Now God can call things that are not as though they are because he's in the creative business. But we call something that is of God that is not of God. That we have missed the river of God. The most vital thing you can have in the state of this woman is that Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water, they're going to thirst again. But the water that I shall give to him, shall give him, will become a transformed water. It will not become a well anymore, but you will become a fountain of water springing up which produces everlasting life. Isaiah 35, to me, tells me what would happen. Jesus tells this woman, if you drink of my water, it will transform. Somebody say transform. It won't just be water coming in. It'll be water coming up and water coming out. It'll become a fountain. Somebody say fountain. It's going to become a fountain. Fountain, say fountain. fountain. Think about it. Not just in, but coming out. He wants to transform everything about. He wants to turn the well into a fountain. And what the Spirit of God is wanting to do, as Jesus could have done, was he wants to reach out and he wants to touch you as the well. He wants to put his hands on you as the well. He wants to touch you as a well. He wants to put his love on you as a well. One who may be deep, one who may be hurting, one who may be dry, one who may have a little bit. He wants to put his hands on you as a well so we can transform everything about you from a well to a fountain. He wants to change you. One touch of heaven will turn your well into a fountain fountain. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I thought that was pretty good. God wants to turn your well into a fountain. Now, if you go to Isaiah 35, you watch what happens when there's a transformation in your life of just deep well in a dry place to a fountain that overflows. See, everything that's about your life begins to get touched by heaven's power. Church, we have lived in lack spiritually. We lived in fear. We were broken up. We were separated. We were told we can't do this. We're told we can't do that. We're told basically we can't pray. We should have been the first ones that this nation called upon to go to war against the virus. Instead of telling us that we are inessential, they should have said, you are the most essential thing now. Will you please, as a church, pray? We should have been first ones contacted and said we need you to hold prayer meeting after prayer meeting. Well, the reason why they don't sometimes is because they do not realize that you are a well ready to become a fountain. And unless we are fountains, they don't see us as a fountain. They just see us as a well, but it's time for a radical change because a, fount because a well don't change things, a fountain does. Look at Isaiah 35 and we'll tell you what you got to get back. I understood you to be hungry enough to say, God, I want all this back. I want everything I lost. I want it back. And things I never knew I had, I want. 
Things I knew that belonged to me that I've never had, I want. Come on, I want to go deeper. I want to go higher. I want to know the kingdom of God. We got to walk as believers in ways we've never walked before. It's time for us to get ugly with hell, get serious with God, get the sin in the let out, let the Holy Ghost in, and let's go after a nation and a generation like we never have before. Let's see God turn your well into a fountain and a fountain into a river. Let's see some radical transformation. That's what heaven wants to do. <laughs> Isaiah 35 gives us the declaration of, of, the, of the outcome of everything Jesus said. See, in John's gospel, just, just a few chapters later, Jesus would say, look, if anyone's thirsty, out of your innermost being, if you come to me, Jesus walked with rivers. Church, let's get here. Jesus walked with rivers. He was a river in the wilderness. He was a river. The early church walked as a river. They were a river of life, of the abundance of God. There was a river, the psalm tells us, Psalm 46, whose streams make glad the city of God. And Isaiah 12 says, with joy and rejoicing, you shall, you shall draw water from the well of redemption because it's going to become a fountain. And Jesus wants to turn your fountain into a river because he walked in a church. Are you thirsty enough to say, I am so dissatisfied? Why do you ask for things? Because you don't have them. How much more of the Holy Spirit does the Father want to give to them that ask? How thirsty are we? This is the challenge as the body of Christ. Do we just go back to normalcy? Do we go back to dead things? We go back to just getting through. We go back to just debating and, and gossiping and all the things that we know never happen in church. We go back to our old lives and just coming to the service. That's convenient. And, and I'm okay with God. God and I have got this conversation going. No, you don't. If you guys really had a conversation, you'd be on your face repenting for all the things that shouldn't be going on in your life. If you really had a conversation with God, holiness would touch your life and your life would recognize eternity connected against it and there would be some serious repentance so God could bring some radical restoration so he could pour a fountain inside of you that would become a river flowing out of you. Getting thin on your amens. Amen. I asked you to shot one every four seconds. Amen. You husbands and wives, when you go home and when you pray, you pray rivers over your family. You pray the river of God down on your children. When you close in prayer in your evening, do you really join a hand? This is just kingdom of spirit. Are you joining hands and speaking the kingdom of God? There is such a river when you come together as husbands and wives. There's such an anointing when you come together as a family and you begin to speak life. My gosh, if one can put a thousand, two can put ten thousand to fly. I've done a lot of marriages. Like you imagine, because God has called forth the order of the marriage in order to in order to establish good children, in other words, good seed, in order for God to in order for God to advance the kingdom. When parents pray, there is tremendous power. Tremendous power. People want me to pray at times. It's like, no, no, no. You have more authority in your home than I do. You come together. You join hands. You speak the word. You declare the kingdom. You rebuke the devourer. You declare the favors of God. You hunger and thirst for revival. Because you get under the word, now you get to use the word. And when you use the word, it becomes a radical river and a fountain pouring out of you. And you begin to see the breakthroughs in your own life. The church cannot just rely on two or three. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. And you are the one that needs to know how to walk in the flow of heaven. Amen. The house is to equip you. Yes. Chapter 35 of Isaiah. Let 
when the river comes, everything comes back. When the river comes, everything comes back. Because it's a river of life, remember? Jesus said, springing up with eternal power, with eternal life. You know what that is? That's creative miracle power of God. You must be, you know, I call me broken and emaciated, diseased. That's what the nation of Israel looked like until Jesus showed up. Here you got this half empty, deep old, deep old well that had great potential, but nothing's being done until the one who is the real river shows up and wants to lay his hands on it and change the whole thing and the whole dynamic. Jesus laid his hands on the church by the Holy Ghost, and I mean everything changed. Out of their innermost being began to flow rivers. The covenant was right there. Mm. I get excited. When heaven touches earth and the river of God sweeps against your life, the Bible says, first, there is great rejoicing. Somebody say rejoicing. rejoicing. There is joy in the house. 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 I said it this morning, laughter is contagious. One person starts laughing and everybody else starts getting the giggles. Nobody knows why anybody's laughing, but there ain't no sad people because all the sadness is driven out because somebody's getting joy. Why? Because someone might be getting touched by a river. And when the river touches the wasteland, when the river touches the dead place, everything begins to change. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad and the desert, verse 1, shall rejoice. Dry bones are coming back to life. Think about it. And the desert shall blossom. I said this the other day. Um, Zechariah, I think it's Zechariah, I don't know. It's a book in the Bible. <laughs> Zechariah talked about what God wanted to do in the last days. See, I'm in the last days. You in the last days? Last days have been going on for a little while, which tells us we're getting really close to the other side of the last days. The last days started the day of Pentecost. We're 2,000 years down the road of the last days. So we're getting there, aren't we? You know what that means? I think what's not time to do, that's quit. Here, God said in Zechariah, and this is chapter 1, Hallelujah. It says, he's going to expand the cities. Verse 17. My city shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will comfort his people and will again choose Jerusalem. Verse 4. Run and speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem shall become, a inhab or shall become inhabited as towns without walls because of the quickness of their growth and the vastness, because the multitudes of all the, that, that's coming in. For, for I, says the Lord, shall become a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory of God in her midst. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The fire and the wall of God swept in. 3,000 souls won in one encounter. Most of them filled with the Holy Spirit. Coming under an anointing of a one accord. So the fire of God fell. And nobody could come near it for the glory. Isaiah says, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice, and blossom is the road. That's why there needs to be joy in the house and joy in your life. It will blossom abundantly. Somebody say abundantly. 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 Say abundantly. abundantly. Say abundantly. abundantly. That's abundantly. abundantly. How, do you, how do you pronounce abundantly? Abundantly. What does abundantly mean? Abundantly. It means abundance. It's more than enough. I want to keep reminding us of the body of Christ that so often we've been sitting in lack. We've been saying it's okay. And we thought that was maybe God's will. I don't care what the world thinks. How many of you care what the world thinks? How many of you really care what the world thinks? Awesome. Now a hand up in the house. Hallelujah. 
you bunch of spiritual rebels. <laughs> Malcontents in the earth. A group of people that don't care what the spirit of the world thinks. Hungry for God and plowing through. It says there's going to be joy. There's going to be rejoicing. There's going to be great increase. It's going to blossom abundantly. It's going to rejoice. Even as the rose is going to come forth and the sound of praise and worship is to begin to come forth because when the river touches your life, everything changes. Stand your feet in the house. Stand your feet in the house. I want to bring this to this point. Three things God wanted to give him, wants to give back. Three things that you need to desire from God. Three main things that the river wants to bring back to you. And if you look at that text in Isaiah, See, the whole goal of Jesus showing up and putting his hands on the well was to transform everything about it to become what God intended it to be. And that well is you. It says, With joy and singing, they shall receive the glory of Lebanon. Lebanon is governmental authority in your spirit. It's kingdom anointing on the inside of you. That's the authority to confront hell with the power of heaven. Lebanon represented the great oaks of God, which always represented kingship and positions and government. And that's what we're supposed to want. We are a kingdom and a priesthood to our God. You have authority as a believer. Governmental anointing. To walk in the kingdom of God and bind what you need to bind, loose what you need to loose, roll up your arm sleeves and go to, and go to war with hell. You carry authority. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Jesus gave it to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I've come that you might have life and life with abundance. But it's giving you back your purpose. Israel was a nation, but they lost who they were, and Jesus came to restore it. And if they didn't want it, you get it. You get your governmental authority and the anointing of God back in your life. The second thing you get, the excellence of Carmel. That is the prophetic heart of God that wants to speak deep into your life. That is the now word from heaven that comes connected to this word right here and gives you the revelation of the directions you need to take. No longer walking in the dark, no longer not knowing the heart of God, but finally knowing what God's plan and purpose is for you. Because as you break forth the bread of the word of God, the word of the Lord can begin to speak to you as that still small voice saying, this is the way you need to walk in it. It's time for the prophetic of God once again to hit the church and confirm, confront, declare, dictate, and release what God really wants to say to the house now. Yeah. We've walked away from these things. But Jesus still walked up to that well. And the third thing, and the Bible says of the valley of Sharon, Sharon is the abundance of God. It's a valley that was beautiful. It blossomed with all kinds of beautiful flowers. Think about yourself right now. Before God, he wants you to blossom with the beauty of heaven. He wants you to think as a child of God and think of yourself as a child of God. He wants you to be changed on the inside so you can know who you are in Christ. You're an adopted son and daughter of the king, called by his name, designed to be set into his presence for fellowship and love. You are not dirt, you are not broken, but by your stripes you are healed. The abundance of God is for your life. 
When these three things come into you, the authority to speak, the prophetic anointing to flow, and the provision of God is who I am. The Bible says then you can begin to speak to those that are faint-hearted, to those that are walking in fear, to those that are broken, to those that are diseased, to those that are hurting, and you can say it's time for you to be healed in Jesus' name. When this river comes, Healing comes. Lift your hands up before the Lord in this house. Father, I give you the radical pray. I give you praise in the radical name of Jesus tonight. I want your people to know who they are. They say, Jesus, show up in my life and put your hands on my shoulders as a well and change me, Lord, into a fountain where joy begins to come and increase begins to come and the anointing of heaven begins to come and the call of God begins to come and the prophetic heart of heaven begins to come and the provision begins to come. Did Jesus speak words for only a few people or did he speak words for everyone? Did he say, seek first the kingdom of God and its right standing in that position, that kingdom on the inside? And he did not say that all these things shall be added to you. Did he say it to a few or did he say it to all? all. If you ask, you seek, you knock, did he say that to a few or to all? all. He said he's the vine and you're the branch. You remain in him connected to the saturation, think about it, of the Holy Spirit pouring, pouring God's kingdom. He says, then you will produce a great harvest because I have designed you for that. Every single one of you in this room is vital to the king. He died for you. Gave it all for you. And he wants to lay his hand on you. And he wants to transform you. He's coming for his church first. Yeah, this world needs God. This nation needs redemption. All these things are needed. But your king does not bypass the church. He does not bypass you. You are who he comes for. Because you are the one he wants to flow through. You are the well that he wants to become a fountain. You are the fountain. He wants to become a river. You are the believer. He wants to empower. You are the saint of God. He wants to anoint. You're the heart. He wants to transform. And you're the life. He wants to provide and recreate. Give him some praise in the house, would you please? Father, we give you praise, 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 we give you praise. We give you praise, we give you praise, we give you praise. We give you praise. We are speaking the heart of God for you. Every one of you tuning in and connecting with us, we are here because we want to see God's kingdom move on your life. We are calling the church to blood bump the redeemed back to the platform and the place that God called it for from the foundations of the world. Jesus is going to get his harvest and you're a part of that radical harvest and he wants his glory and his anointing to flow down and pour through your life. You are not alone. You've not been abandoned. You've not been forsaken, but your king wants to lay hands on the well of your life and turn you into a fountain. He wants to transform you. Every part of you. Man, I can't say that enough. Father, we give you praise. Father, we give you praise. I'm just going to pray for people. I want to lay hands on people. If you want that, don't come down if you don't want it. But if you want that, I want you to come down. And I want you to lay hands and ask God to turn your well into a fountain. And if you need healing, we are going to pray for that. This morning, I prayed for specifics. Tonight, if there is a need for healing, we will come after every disease. Listen, the fountain in your life will confront any disease in your body. The fountain in your life will confront any disease in your body. I will say it again. 
the fountain in your life will confront any disease in your body. Let me say hallelujah. So cancers, it doesn't matter. Diabetes, it doesn't matter. Tumors, it doesn't matter. Kidney problems, it doesn't matter. Heart issues, it doesn't matter. Back problems, it doesn't matter. Eye issues, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. It does not matter. When he transformed you from a, from a well to a fountain, there's healing power in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody give him a shout of praise.